This week in Behind the Pulpit, Pastor Bob and Pastor Dave welcome in our special guest, Clint Watkins, onto the show. NBC is home for me where I grew up. The Watkins Old House is what I call Vintage it. Vintage <laughs> Watkins is what we're calling it. Yeah. <laughs> Once again, Taylor Swift has made headlines with some controversial lyrics in her new album. And it's called Tortured Poets Department. It's a little bit of a caricature of the evangelical movement and what we stand for and what mm. we believe and what we're trying to accomplish. The pastors and Clint talk about the parable of the prodigal son. That was one of the places where I was prodigaling as a child. Is there a chart for that that we can <laughs> use to discern this? All right. Well, <laughs> this today we have a special exercise where we're going to build a chart on the show. And Pastor Dave talks about what the Bible has to say about slavery. 19th century race-based slavery, which was based on kidnapping and was slavery for life. We have an exciting show ahead, and we hope that you enjoy this week of Behind the Pulpit. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Behind the Pulpit for May the 6th, 2024. Uh, we're so glad you're here with us, as usual, to inaugurate in a brand new month. April is behind. May is upon us. And lots of things are happening in May. Lots of things happened this last week. As usual, we're bringing it all to you right here. And I am joined by my esteemed colleague over to my right. There he is. I love the month of May. <laughs> I have some serious blooming going on in the landscaping. In you heard it here, house. folks. Dave There's has been blooming. White flowers coming <laughs> out. I now cut the lawn, I think, three times. It's very uh, mild in terms of weather. The bugs are not exactly as dense as they're going to be later on in the summer and it's just a great time of year i That's love true. it it's true i've heard i've heard that april flowers april showers bring may flowers is that so that's true at your house at my you, house, you fit the uh... May floods bring June bugs. That's what happens over there. <laughs> oh, that that <laughs> may happen too, as well. By the way, this last weekend was uh, was May the fourth, right? So Star Wars Day. Mm. Oh, I should have brought down our the lightsabers. We could have dueled in honor of Star Wars Day. Well, epic you fail on our part. Real opportunity I did. There, I did. It was sad. But you know what? Good news. We do have a special guest here today. I don't know if he likes Star Wars or not, but I'm going to introduce him. Uh, some of you might know Clint Watkins. Clint, where are you, are you coming to us from a galaxy far, far away? Where are you? Some would say that over here in Amish land in <laughs> that, Lancaster. That, that qualifies. The Sith Lords are around you in central Pennsylvania. <laughs> yeah. We're not Clint, in Kansas anymore. Yeah. Clint, tell folks really quickly who you are and uh, uh, why we might have you on our podcast today. Well, I was born and raised at NBC across the parking lot uh, where my home used to be before the new and improved family. Is it the family life center? Is that what you guys call it? Youth and family ministry building. YFMB. Uh, some sort of acronym. Um, we did. Yeah. And I'm also, a, we tried uh, to come up a with a shorter partner. one that was more memorable, but we never quite got there. So that's, that's what we're going oh, with for I, now. The Watkins old house is what <laughs> I call vintage it. Vintage <laughs> Watkins is what we're calling it. Yeah, the new and improved. It's got some um, potential. So yeah. Uh, NBC is home for me where I grew up. And then I'm also a world partner with a ministry called Disciple Makers. Uh, so I'm in campus ministry and we live in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Awesome. Well, I'm sorry about that, but we're glad that you're joining us from <laughs> afar. <laughs> Clint, I see a pretty good collection of books behind you there, man. I, I don't know about, we, about you, but we talk a lot about books on our, our program. I see a, a pretty good uh, swath of pillar New Testament commentaries Ooh. there over over your right hand shoulder, Let's man. Dave noticed those. Are you are you a pillar New Testament fan? Looks like you got a you're well on your way to the full set. Dave can spot a, yeah. a <laughs> know, biblical commentary from a far away. <laughs> that is a hawk eye. That you know, is, this is actually that's one first of those Timothy. Um, I can stock, see it from here. <laughs> one of those stock Zoom um, backgrounds. You know, I just put it on. It's it's actually they fake. look good. That's not <laughs> your <laughs> background. <laughs> Oh, okay. no, he's, he's, he, he is joshing you, Dave. Well, over your left shoulder is a two copies of Prodigal God, which we're going to be talking about uh, on yes. the podcast yeah. today. So uh, you came fully prepared and read up, read up on the on the appropriate topic. So very good. It's actually three copies, so uh, I think you got to get your eyesight checked. You know yeah. what? You're right. You do. Uh, he's he is I getting older. So. By the way, well, we will come back to our great book war segment, and we're going to give Clint uh, the segment today because he is also an author, which he didn't mention. So uh, stay tuned for that. Before we get there, why don't we jump into our in the news segment? In the news.
All right, so lots of things always, as always, happening in the news. We live in the 21st century. It's 2024, uh, which means the news cycle changes about every 24 seconds, uh, and it's really hard to uh, to change. It really and to does. Pick. It does. I know. You, know, it, you, you pull your thumb down. It's, it's as quick as a tweet. It's a brand new headline. And X. By the way, so Twitter is now X. Do, do you? By X, the way, do you X Bob people has a question. or do you tweet? Do is tweet a thing anymore, or do you now X people? You just I'm going to X you. I heard people debating this before. What's what's your take on that? I don't know the appropriate verb to go along Have with you the name X'd? change. <laughs> I simply follow people. I don't actually participate in a oh, in see. a contributory way. You don't let your your thoughts bleed out of your mind. You just kind of keep them keep them all safe up there. <laughs> <laughs> or yeah, I don't know if they're safe up there, but I keep them up there. Yeah, I don't know what what it's called now that you. Now that you mentioned that, you ask really good questions right. on this podcast, and I don't know the answers. I know. So. Well, I'm going to give you a second. I have second. a feeling you're just getting started on this. I am. I'm going to give you a second to think about that because I was um, sent a very good news story that I think is worthy of mentioning today. Our good friend Taylor Swift is, as always, in the news, although this time you not— You say good friend, like— She's— I, 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 am, I think she might watch our podcast. <laughs> she might be— Actually, by the on Sunday, Ben, Tim. After uh, this uh, headline, she may not I don't want know. to be friends anymore. T- Tim's brother Ben, you know, remember Ben? The U- the Ucas boys were on here a few weeks ago. Yes. Ben came up to me on Sunday after the service, and we were talking, and he was with a he he was with a a, a lady, um, and uh, I didn't recognize her, and I I, I introduced myself. I, I don't know what their what their connection is, uh, but but Ben introduced her to me as a friend of the podcast. And I said, wow, I didn't know we had podcast friends, but apparently we do. So uh, big shout out. We have a lot of friends. We got a lot of friends. Well, so yeah. what I'm saying is that maybe maybe if we met Taylor Swift, she would say, I've seen. I've seen. But yeah, actually, another thing, my, my mother-in-law said uh, Amanda's uh, aunt actually found us on the interwebs. So uh, word's getting out about Behind the Pulpit, Pastor Dave. Shout out to Amanda's aunt. There you go. Uh, Aunt Becky, there you go. It's uh, uh, so so anyway. That's that's not the end of the news story, but maybe, maybe that I did I did break another news story right there. Uh, all right, Taylor Swift. So the headline is this: Taylor Swift's new album. Sorry, Taylor uh, draws criticism from Christian leaders who say it mocks God and Christians. Now, let me just say, whenever we talk about Taylor Swift, which Tim likes to do a lot, she's in the news a lot. I always think back to when I was in seminary back in like two thousand and seven, two thousand and eight. So we're going back almost 20 years now. The earth now. was just cooling the earth, down. It was. It was. And <laughs> the the Taylor Swift, uh, I think, self-titled first album came out, and she was singing about teardrops on her guitar and, uh, you know, the, the boy who broke up with her, the, the first one, and then, and then also Tim McGraw. And now... And now I'm reading, 20 years later, she has followed this path where she's got this new album, and it's called Tortured Poets Department, um, which people are saying mocks God and Christians. So here, here's what they're saying. They, they, they list off a few um, lyrics. Do you mind if I, if I read the lyrics? I have not heard it, so I can't sing it. Do you mind if I read some Taylor Swift lyrics here? I guess here? that's our only option. It's, it's Unless poetic. Unless you want right. rap them. Okay, so uh, <laughs> this is a song called uh, But Daddy, I Love Him. And this one said, the lyrics go like this, but daddy, I love him. I just learned these people only rage, raise you to cage you. Sarah's and Hannah's in their Sunday best, clutch, clutch in their pearls, Cyan, what a mess. I just learned these people try and save you because they hate you. And then she goes on um, to talk about God uh, save the most judgmental creeps who say they want what's best for me, sanctimoniously performing soliloquies I'll never see, thinking it can change the beat of my heart when he touches me, and on and on and on and on and on. And then she's got another song called Guilty as Sin, uh, which says, What if I roll the stone away? They're going to crucify me anyway. What if the way you hold me is actually what's holy? And then the article goes on to say, of the 31 songs, uh, they all, uh, of the 31 songs, um, uh, many contain an E designation, which means it's explicit, and several songs have the, uh, the F word included in there. And so the author of this article is wondering, and several, several other people were, t- were tweeting or Xing, whatever you call it, that maybe we should reconsider listening to Taylor Swift. So what do you have to say about that, Pastor Dave? What's your gut reaction? And Clint, feel free to jump in here too. I don't, I don't know what your relationship is with Taylor Swift, but uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you an opportunity to weigh in here. Well, um, 
It's a helpful uh, synopsis. It's a little bit of a caricature of the evangelical movement and what we stand for and what mm -hmm. we believe and what we're trying to accomplish. So it's good to know, actually, as we're thinking about crafting persuasive messages for our target audience, what are the kind of things that they think about us and how do they summarize our position and how might we... Uh, maybe give a counter narrative to the yeah. narrative that's being displayed in that song. How can we contextualize and go, well, it's it's not that we hate you and it's not that we're we're trying to save you. Yeah. Um, so let me just cor make some corrections here as, as far as what you're saying. Uh, it's sad. You know, that, yeah. that particular packaging uh, sure does make us look very dysfunctional and toxic. And maybe there's some components of our movement that are, and maybe we yeah. should own that. But generally speaking, <laughs> I don't think that's a fair depiction of yeah. orthodox christianity that's also a reminder of the power of popular culture to influence people so taylor swift is 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 quite influential i've heard um i don't follow her anymore but uh <laughs> you know there's an old saying i can't remember who said this but um somebody who was like a philosopher he said i don't really care in my generation who writes the books but um let me write the songs Mm. Uh, because that's actually that's a good um, that's a good one how you really change and and shape the capture hearts minds of, and hearts right especially the up and coming generation so yeah. you know she's having an impact she's got she's got lots and lots of Swifty fans so so Clint you work with young people uh, do you got any Swifties in your uh, in your ministry oh yeah actually I have just, you heard of Taylor uh, Swift used... in in Lancaster Pennsylvania or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got we got neighbors who are hardcore Swifties like they go to like satellite Taylor Swift parties. Yeah. Here in Lancaster, I actually think she I was actually, from like Central Pennsylvania originally, wasn't she? I think you're right. Yeah, so, I forget the and name of the town, think, but she's yeah. Doesn't she have a church background too? Uh yeah, I, I think she does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we we definitely have a ton of Swifties on college campuses. Um, so yeah, I don't even know. Probably a thousand different thoughts, but the main thing that came to mind as you were quoting that is, um, I actually think it's an opportunity to understand culture better mm. and and leverage that for gospel opportunities. And I think of Paul in Athens, he quotes, you know, famous pagan worship lyrics in order to share the gospel. Um, so yeah, I think that article that you mentioned is recommending discernment in terms of helping parents <laughs> uh, with their kids and the music that they're listening right. to. But I also think it's a helpful window into where culture is at and you know, what, what they do think about the gospel. Um, so I think there's still some opportunities to make the, connections. The gospel touch point through Taylor Swift. That's what you're getting at right there. Yeah. But be <laughs> careful how old you are. It's got an E rating. Right. Yeah. I didn't even know yep, E was exactly. a thing. Apparently that's a thing. Explicit. Mm. But interest, again, interesting. That's the 20-year progression of where she's, she's kind of gone. Because I remember when I was in youth ministry, people would hold her up as being an example of kind of how to do it right. And um, maybe mm -hmm. the other thing I would say in there is, you know, money and power eventually come in and capture your heart, as we talked about in the, uh, the parable yesterday, which we'll come back to, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, money does something to you and fame and all that. All right, well, good thoughts. Anything else on Taylor Swift before we, we move on to the, the book war? I'm satisfied. All right. <laughs> Hearing no objections, I will take us into our next segment, The Great Book War. Now, those of you that have, have been friends of the podcast and you followed us know that Dave and I have had this running gun battle uh, for uh, recommending books. And last week, Pastor Dave took a great leap forward because we went to this conference and he received, what was it, 20 books for free? People were just giving you old books. For the record, I did start J.C. Ryle's commentary <laughs> on Luke Volume 1, and I actually quoted him in my sermon yesterday. You did. So, you did. Uh, it was impressive. I did a lot of reading for this sermon, actually. Good. I'm looking forward to hearing I was trying the... to find something new and unique to such a well-known parable, so That's good. it took a lot of research. Well, before I turn it over to Clint, I do want to say that I got an email this week, Pastor Dave, from another book table that was at the conference letting me know that I won their sweepstakes. Oh, that's right. And they're sending me four or five books Congratulations. this week. Congratulations. So not quite as many as you. I'm but, looking uh, forward to this package coming in for you. <laughs> some David Powell, some books, and this one book called Untangling Your Emotions, which I actually wound up buying, not realizing I was going to win it, and it's actually pretty good. So maybe that'll be a recommendation in the future. But before we get there, uh, Clint, you are an author, and so we thought we'd let you take this segment and share a bit about your, your book and uh, your story, which is pretty powerful, and, uh, and all that you do. So... 
tell us about your uh, your tome that you've written. <laughs> tome. <laughs> um, by the way, real quick, I I highly recommend Untangling Emotions. Do you? Um, okay, good. It's actually the the book that I quote the most, other than the Bible, in my book. <laughs> ah, <laughs> um, okay. So I've seen I it for a few years, it. and I haven't I haven't purchased it. So this is this is good confirmation that uh. Uh, that, that I'm going to be reading it. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Um, so I wrote a book called Just Be Honest, which I think I, I talked about when I was at BTP uh, back in the summer. You did. I forgot you were here in the summer, but it's not been out. But now it's out. It's on the bestseller list right now. Bestseller list of... Uh, it, whatever bestseller, bestseller list you want to be. The NBC bestseller <laughs> list. I've, I, I have seen nice. people with copies around here. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So, um, the, the story behind the book. So back in 2018, we lost our firstborn son due to a fatal condition. Um, and we learned halfway through the pregnancy that we were going to lose him. So, uh, that just threw us into a, a really long season of grief and, and, uh, anxiety and stress and wrestling with the Lord in particular. Um, and scripture is what got us through the storm, particularly the, the invitation to lament and to be honest with the Lord. Um, you know, the Psalms are full of really difficult questions and, uh, I mean, really visceral prayers. And over a third of the Psalms are laments. And so for us, one of the main things that God used to get us through the storm and through our grief was his invitation to just be honest with him in prayer. Uh, while at the same time, we had a difficult time in church because uh, worship and just kind of the, the atmosphere tends to be a little bit more positive and, and triumphant. And so we felt really isolated and, and dislocated. But then we kept coming back to scriptures and, and even seeing the Psalms are a book of corporate worship, you know. So, um, yeah, we just we just found that wrestling with the Lord is is often overlooked but so key and foundational to to walking with Jesus. Mm. Uh, and so I wanted to to share some of our experience with the world and even model how we can be honest with our stories of suffering, but then point people back to the scriptures to see, uh, yeah, it's okay to wrestle with the Lord. And, and it's actually good to weep and to mourn uh, and to, to engage with our difficult emotions. Good. Do you have a, a, a copy of it on the uh, bookshelf behind you that you can show us what it looks like? I do. Yeah. There we go. Look, looks like sort of got just be honest. Uh, it, it's and you can find it on Amazon and wherever you find books, or is it exclusively on Amazon? It's on Amazon. I mean, you can find it in a bunch of different places. Apparently, like you can even buy it through the Target app <laughs> if you want. Really? Like, you know, okay. You, you're. You know, you're picking up your groceries or medicine. You want to get a book by Clint Watkins. But, yeah, Amazon is the main place to It's going to be on that front bookshelf when I walk into Target. That's yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, <laughs> alongside Taylor Swift's album. That's great. Well, thanks for sharing that. And, and I know you, you've just been uh, very impactful for a lot of people in, in your, uh, your vulnerability and generosity and sharing your story and what you and your, your wife uh, walk through. And I'm sure that's, that's brought a lot of depth to your ministry. Um, do you feel like that's, has God opened up doors as a result of what you've walked through? I think so. Yeah. And thankfully, I mean, our, our organization is really tight. Like we really are, um, in some ways a, a, a family feel organization mm -hmm. and it was our ministry team that, that came around us during that season, but it's led to some really cool opportunities within the ministry across all of our campuses. Um, like we're seeing lament become more normal, even in worship. Mm -hmm. the ways that we, we sing songs together, the ways that we pray. And I'm sure you guys are aware, but the the younger generations are experiencing uh, mental health struggles uh, in increasing numbers, but they're also more willing than any other generation to talk about it. And so mm -hmm. it, it's amazing to see scripture and this whole idea of like talk therapy. We think it's like a... Right a recent phenomenon, you know, that, that modern psychology came up with that. But like, that's what God has been doing for his people for thousands of years. He's been inviting them to just come and talk to him. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're, we're able to, to show students on college campuses, Hey, your heartache is real, but you can also have a lot of hope by being honest with the God who made you. Mm. Uh, and that's, that's where you can really find an anchor for your soul. So it's, it's allowing us to go deeper with a lot of students. Okay. Right, that's a good word. 
Pastor Dave, do you have any questions before we move on to uh, to the next segment? Now, just a word of thanks in terms of pastoral care, Clint. I know several people that are greatly benefiting from this this excellent book that you've written. So appreciate your ministry, brother. Thanks, Dave. All right. So go buy it. Just be honest. Get vulnerable. <laughs> All right. So we are uh, moving on to our viewer questions. We had a few that got written in. And just a reminder, if you are a friend of the podcast, if you watch us, don't be afraid to subscribe to the YouTube channel um, if you have not done that. And write us some questions. We love questions. We love to answer questions. So let's see what we got today. First question up here is... Did you put them on slides? No, I forgot. We we don't have them on slides, um, so I will read them off for our audience here. I have them on my screen, so read. Read away. All right, so our first question is a tough one, and this is what the first question is. If everything will be perfect in the new heavens and the new earth, we will have the Holy Spirit, and there will be no sin and no death for eternity. Why didn't God create the world like that in the first place so that there would have been no fall of man and no one in hell for eternity? Yeah, good question. That's a, a question that comes up a lot. I think we probably have uh, discussed that in some other form uh, in, in previously on the podcast. Um, one of the things that um, I know that, that kind of popped in my, in my mind at some point um, uh, was reading through a, 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 a devotional by uh, Nancy Guthrie, who has walked through her own struggles. Um, but one of the things she mentioned in there, she was walking through finding Jesus in the Old Testament, and there was a devotion on Genesis 3 talking about this, this very question. And one of the profound things she said was the, uh, the idea that if, um, if there was no sin that came in the world, we wouldn't actually know our need for a Savior and know the beauty of redemption. So I think that's one aspect of this, this question that comes in there. Um, why God planned it that way? You know, we, we don't know exactly the mind of God, but I, I do think there was a piece of him wanting us to to experience that beauty and actually choose to come to him. So what would you add to that? It's a very difficult question. It's the question of the ages, right? Um, I think that there's some great philosophical minds that have tried to tackle this. I remember getting to the end of um, Romans chapter 9, and and there there was an Edwards quote that was particularly meaningful to me that certain attributes of God um, would not be possible to be glorified had not the world been allowed to fall into Mm. sin and disruption the way that we were. So God in his infinite wisdom and his providence and his sovereign divine plan chose to glorify himself in this way. And there are things that we don't understand. Um, But Mm -hmm. one day I think it will become clear to us. And uh, we know that our God... um, will we'll bring all things together for the good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Uh, Dostoevsky has a great quote about this, and he says, uh, I'm not going to do this quote justice, but he says something like, one day in the great finale, uh, in in the day of justice, when, when God makes all things right, uh, something so wonderful will come to pass that it will make it possible for all of us to forgive all that has happened and also justify the fact that God allowed it to happen. So mm. one day we will fully understand that question. That day is not today. I think that's kind of the whole po- point of the book of Job, that there's this suffering and evil and sin in the world that has uh, effects that are devastating, and and we're not given an answer as to why those things exist. How come a perfect world do- doesn't exist? One day it will, uh, but I think right now Job is told I need you to trust me. I'm a lot bigger than you. I think God asks Job like over 70 questions at the end of that book saying, you know, where were you when I made the foundations of the earth and when mm. I, when I uh, you know, created all of this saying there's, there's a transcendent knowledge gap, Job, between me and you and God knows all. And so we submit to him because we understand our finitude and our limitations in that way. That doesn't make it easy. Uh, that doesn't mean we can't mm-hmm. be totally honest, as Clint just mentioned, about uh, those things that really grieve us and are incredibly sad. We know that we have a Savior that weeps alongside of us, and we have a God who understands our pain. We can go to him, um, and one day we trust that he's going to make, make things right, make all things new. So, Hey, that's, that's good. That the, the hope of the new heavens and the new earth is a very real hope, and so that was uh, at least part of the question. Here Clint, as well. would you add anything to that uh, question there? Is that something that, that you wanted to weigh yeah. in on? I mean, that's a tough one. The, the verse I was coming to mind as you were talking— this idea of Romans eight twenty eight, um, 
you know, mm-hmm. God works all things uh, for good for those who love him like that. But then right before that, this is kind of what you were saying, Dave. That's when he talks about well, what do we do when we wait as we wait for that to happen? He says we groan as we wait for redemption. So you kind of have that mm-hmm. reality similar to Job where we're yeah. trusting God will make all things new. But that doesn't mean we're just like, yay, it's going to be great when that happens. No, mm-hmm. Paul says as we wait for that, it's okay to groan. Mm-hmm. And God actually groans with us. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's good. And he calls us to, to walk alongside of our brothers and sisters who are groaning and um, be with them as they experience that too. So good. it's a good question. Hopefully that gives you some categories for some answers. So good. Noah, do we want to try more? Or well, let me, let me ask you the second question here because it, it's going to dovetail us into your sermon. So the second question that was written in was, is obedience to the Bible with a discontent heart worthless and this person is thinking specifically of the older son's obedience to his father in the parable of the prodigal uh sons so i don't know if you had wrestled with that as you were preparing this week um what would you say to that yeah so sometimes um there's this train analogy that people use that like okay so we have our intellect our emotions and our will and like Choo choo. We we as a person we kind of like we're on this choo-choo. track and it always has to go in that order and so you know I don't know that that's really always the case. Sometimes I think uh, obeying God just because it's the right thing to do uh, will actually get me to a place of of loving that which is good as well. So sometimes I'll admit I have mm-hmm. begrudging obedience yep. and it's taking that step in begrudging obedience that I learned to see the joy of actually fulfilling God's command. So I don't like the word worthless there to describe mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, discontented. What was it? Discontented obedience? Is that Discontented obedience. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know that worthless is the right term. I think as a Christian, those of us who've been born again, uh, sometimes our flesh needs to be warred against and our the train, the choo-choo train, sometimes the emotions don't need to lead yeah, yeah. the train. We untangle the emotions, right? Um, but if we're talking about a non-believer, if we're talking right. about someone who, who, is, um, who is counter to the cause of God and against uh, the things of heaven and the gospel, um, you know, I think, I think that those kind of righteous acts in the book of Isaiah are called filthy rags. So, you know, we're not interested in your acts of self-righteousness that are supposed to make you look good. God's not pleased with that. So um, someone once said, even our tears of repentance need to be washed in the blood of the lamb. So, you know, without the gospel, we don't have anything that's pleasing to God meritoriously. But um, I don't want to say worthless in terms of a a follower of Christ Mm -hmm, taking steps mm -hmm. of obedience, but we do have to check our motivation and go, why am I doing this? Is it, is it the right is it the reason uh, is it the right reason to obey god and if it's not that's like a check engine light on the car on the train here to keep the train analogy going something, something's wrong with the engine let's pop the hood and see what's going on here that i might need to untangle so gotcha yeah i don't know that's a complicated question gotcha but do you add anything to that or well i would just say i mean you, eugene peterson uh wrote a book called a long obedience in the same direction mm-hmm. uh which was actually a book on the psalms but I, I when i get a question like this i often think about that concept that god calls us to be obedient and sometimes we're going to wrestle along the way but ultimately obedience is going to bring blessing i think in the long run so um, even if it's hard to do that, it's still good for us to do that as we're asking for God get our, to get our hearts in the right place. Yeah. Does yeah. the question specifically call the person a believer or a Christian, or is it more general than they that? They don't. <clears throat> They're just referencing the uh, you know the older son in in the parable. Oh, okay. Well, so I you know, know I don't think the older son is a is a true regenerate uh, character. I think he represents the Pharisees and the scribes who um, ultimately. Never come in to the party and celebrate, and they don't come to the table. Actually, uh, if that story was finished, yeah, Kenneth Bailey says the older son would have taken up a rod and beat the father, because that's exactly what the Pharisees did. They wow. they decided to come after, um, you know, the loving character of God in that mm. in that story. So that's the uh, the cliffhanger. Of course, we have to see the end of the Gospel of Luke to see all that get played out. Mm-hmm. But they never mm-hmm. do rejoice with the son who's uh, so excited about these lost things. Instead, they actually attack the one throwing the party. It's good. 
All right, well, uh, that's a good segue into your message from yesterday. As we've been alluding to, uh, we covered uh, Luke 15. We've been making our way through Luke. We're in a section we're calling Stories with Jesus, and we're looking at all these parables. And perhaps the most famous parable in Luke, or either that one or the Good Samaritan, um, uh, came to the forefront yesterday, the parable of the prodigal son. So why don't you summarize a little bit about what you, you covered in the message? Yeah, I wonder if Luke 15 is almost like a center point of Luke's gospel. There's so much there that mm-hmm. brings together so many different themes that we've already talked right. about and then we'll continue to talk about. Of course, that general theme of Jesus coming to seek and save the lost. There's so much lostness that's highlighted in Luke 15. Right. Yeah. And it's such a brilliant uh, chapter, all packaged together in response to some grumbling. The Pharisees <laughs> and scribes were doing some murmuring that Jesus eats with sinners. And, of course, uh, he wears that like a badge of honor. Yeah, I eat with sinners. Rejoice with me. I eat with sinners. But they won't do that. They're murmuring. The same word used uh, in the Septuagint translation of the Israelites murmuring against Moses, by the way, for you technical people. So he tells three, case you were wondering, three <laughs> parables about lost things, lost sheep, lost coin, lost son. Uh, somebody goes out and finds a sheep. A woman uh, searches and finds the coin. Nobody goes out to find the son. And, uh, of course, this is a parable about how God welcomes in uh, sinners who return back home to him. And it's actually really a parable about the older brother. So the whole thing was crafted in such a way uh, to show the characters a mirror, uh, show the Pharisees a mirror of the kind of characters that they're being. Mm -hmm. And uh, to show them that they, they are not really in right relationship with God, though they think they are. And it's a challenge to them as Jesus entreats them to show compassion and mercy towards sinners like he is. Yeah. So yeah. that's Luke chapter 15. So um, obviously a well-known parable, uh, and people might be familiar, have read like Tim Keller's book or, or whatever else and are familiar with a little bit of what you did in, in the message yesterday. But I, I'm always drawn to that older brother character in there. And what's interesting to me always with the parable is that I think in our natu- natural minds we're, we're thinking about the younger brother and how he messed up, and we so often miss our own proclivities as the older brother, and, and we, even though we know the story, we often miss the point of the story, like the Pharisees. Do, do you find that, um, you know, you, you do a lot of counseling, you know, when you, when you counsel people that, do you find there's more older brothers than younger brothers, or is it about an even split, or, and, and, and do you ever use this parable in, in your uh, interaction with folks? I mean, I think we all struggle with an older brother heart sometimes. It's mm. part of the natural sin of pride and self-righteousness that just uh, comes so easily to me and uh, many of us. So it's something to wrestle with. Uh, yeah, so we have to check that and make sure we're being humble and um, understanding that we're right because of Christ. I will push back a little bit here. Um, I don't think everything we do is pharisaical. In other words, I, you know, this, this like the Taylor Swift song. Uh, so we, we get caricatured in some ways just because we want to take a certain position or stand for mm. our convictions. We're automatically like thrown this wet blanket on top of us going, you're judgmental, you're self-righteous, you're a Pharisee. And when in reality, we're like, no, we're just trying to maintain the same convictions that Christians have maintained for 2000 years. So, um, could we just do that without being called a Pharisee every single right. time? Right. We're not judging you, but, um, remember the the younger son did actually repent and come home. So it's okay for us sometimes to say that's a problem and the person involved in that problem really has an obligation to repent and come home. And it's okay to like stand there without necessarily being a Pharisee. I think most of us would rejoice and jump out of our skin if we saw a sinner actually repent and come home. I I don't, you know, I don't necessarily think we all always need to be caricatured as Pharisees, but Yes, it's a problem that we all need to wrestle with in our hearts, and sure, it's a good point. So how do you how do you discern that? How do you discern when it's something that's an elder brother issue versus it's just us being um, firm in our convictions? Mm-hmm. Is is there is I will ask you is there a chart for that that we can <laughs> use to discern this? All right, well, <laughs> this today we have a special exercise where we're going to build a chart on the show on the show like live. Oh my goodness! All right, look, and there happens and to be some markers I got some right sharpies. here. I don't know if you want to do a chart. Sorry, too, you can pull up a but... paper and a sharpie in your house if you have one. <laughs> If I'm you want to just, participate at home, you can draw this too. I'm just going to make a, like a simple T chart here, okay? So two sides, and on the one side we'll put the word religion, and on the other side we're going to put the word 
gospel. Ooh. Okay, so let's put a big line down the middle, a vertical line. All right, I love so me now some interactive have, charts have, right here. We have a T chart: religion versus gospel. Okay, so Is let's that, just, that's what they call this—a T chart, huh? Yeah, yeah. All right. And I, I, I first saw this from from Tim Keller, but I think we can we can create our own. So on the on the left side, in terms of religion, I'm just going to put obey. Uh, leads to being accepted okay and then on the right side on the gospel side we're going to say accepted leads to me obeying now that uh order and that the reversal of that order is critical right i don't obey to be accepted by god i'm accepted by god in christ therefore i obey so that's a very big difference, and that's a good thing to think about in our own hearts. So that's kind of the the, the Ephesians two and the the James uh, two tension, right? Yeah. The uh, faith faith of that works is dead, or you're saved by grace, right? Right, right. And then the other two things I'm going to just contrast here is on the one side, the religion side, it's very fear based. My motivation is because I'm anxious, I'm afraid, I'm insecure. And so I better get this right because, uh, you know, it's scary. And then on the gospel side, my motivation is based on joy. It's based on delight. It's based on uh, gratitude. I, I, I find pleasure in obedience, right? Uh, where would I rather be uh, than obeying God in his, in his presence, right? So that's a little bit of a, a contrast there. If we see that in our hearts, what do you? Th you got any comments about the fear versus joy? No, thing? I think that's think that's really good. Fear fear uh, is done out of I'm going to be punished if I don't do this, which really doesn't produce that that overflowing joy that comes when you recognize, oh my gosh, look at what what lengths somebody went to save me and how I respond to that. Right, right. And so another <laughs> thing to put on our chart is my sense of self if i'm in religion is based on my performance right so if my performance is good then i'm feeling good about myself i had a good day god must like me today if i had a bad day man god must be really upset with me today mm. so it goes up and down mm. and like bowling i can put the ball in the gutter on either side right I, and it's just it just can get me right so that's that's religion it's based on performance whereas they're in the gospel uh, you know, my, my self-identity, my self-acceptance, my sense of being okay is really based on the righteousness of Christ. And so that's a big word that just means Christ has made me right with God. It's because of his work, not my work, that that I'm accepted and that I, um, I trust not in my performance, but in his performance on my behalf. And so mm. uh, that's a contrast that I think we need to maybe think about when we're wrestling with our emotions and untangling them so to speak so there's there's the chart i'm just gonna leave it there well, Bob. Pastor i Dave, could keep that, going that chart is sublime what do you guys think my goodness i am in the as tim would say i'm in the rafters right now man wow it's chart time clint. i have by the way i've never a seen any, dave any comments smile? from clint on the chart man what do you think <laughs> are you are you digging this man it's pretty good i, I I am. Yeah. <laughs> did you did you write your own at home? He was like he was critiquing. <laughs> By the way, I've never seen Dave smile so much as when a chart is in front of him. This is speaking of joy, this is what brings you joy right there. Uh you know, it's <laughs> it's just beautiful. I, everything in the world should fit into a chart somewhere. It's it's great to have my my brain get organized, you know. So charts help me do that, you know. Well, Clint, what thoughts do you have on the on the prodigal uh, son? And would you ask any you know questions here? <laughs> well, could you run through the gospel side of the list again? Yeah, sure. Just so, the words that you put down. Yeah, on the gospel side, <clears throat> I am accepted, therefore I obey. Sorry, I'm trying to get the camera right here. And then on the gospel side, uh, it's very motivated by my source of joy and uh, wanting to obey God out of sheer delight and. Um, I find pleasure, like John Piper says, you know, God is most glorified in me when I'm most satisfied in him. It's a joy-based obedience. And then my sense of self uh, is not based on my performance here, but it's based on Christ's performance and his righteousness that he's given me as a gift. So, Awesome. Yeah, I couldn't, um, I have a different feed, so I can't see the, it just looks like an orange blob to oh, me. Okay. On, oh, here on man. Stage, so gotcha. I was Boom. listening, but I We'll take a catch. picture and send it to you. Yeah. So you can like <laughs> dream, I, dream about it later on. <laughs> I love what you're what you're saying. The when, as you're sharing all that, one of the passages that came to mind is Titus two, where Paul says the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, 
and training us to renounce ungodliness. And I think it's easy to think that grace saves you. And then it's like all about how good you do afterwards. Mm. Um, mm. But Paul connects grace to sanctification as well. Ooh, hot right. off the press. I got the text, right, the chart. Man. There it is. You got your right. own you can copy. Just marin- let that marinate for, wow. for a few minutes right there. Yeah, I know. Grace is personified in Titus as the master teacher, and it's grace that actually is transformative. It's not a get-out-of-jail-free kind of thing. It's grace that actually is the gas in the tank that causes me to continue to love God and obey God. And uh, we're saved by grace, but we also grow by grace. Mm. And so that's a good support verse there. So. Very helpful. Uh, it looks like you've been through the prodigal God based on the fact that you've got it behind you in your shelf. Any um, any gleanings? It's got several copies. Pastor gleanings Dave. from that study yourself? <laughs> Have you taught through that parable? What what stands out to you about this magnificent story that Jesus told that's so timeless? Well, I remember. So our ministry we emphasize discipleship. Like we we go really deep with students, um, and I remember being discipled through the same concept um similar to prodigal god have you have you guys read um discipline of grace by jerry bridges Mm -hmm. yeah um like that was kind of a go-to resource especially for young pharisaical freshmen like me i i kind of straddled the fence i was both an older and younger brother (laughs) um i feel like i still am i'm the the repentant rebel but the recovering pharisee um Mm. yeah i just feel like that that's such a helpful I mean, your chart, I think, really nails it. And it's so easy to swing, to be pulled back onto the, the side of religion, forgetting the the grace and mm-hmm. the joy that we have in Christ. Um, if there yeah, is one thing really Dave solid. can do, it's create a chart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so just a little bit of a second book recommendation. Um, I found Kenneth Bailey's book on the story of the prodigal son, the cross and the prodigal, to be super helpful. If you're not familiar with him, you should go to Amazon and pick up a copy of this or anything Ken Bailey has written. This is a treasure trove of what I call cultural archaeology. So he's not searching for artifacts, but he goes back and studies the culture in the Middle East and in the first century Mm -hmm. and understands how each image was thought about back then and brings so much light uh, to the story that any scholar who's really written about this or preached about this or thought about this in the last 20 years has probably interacted with Kenneth Bailey and is indebted to yeah. uh, this scholar for what he did. In the end, um, he actually has a great quote about parables that I thought would be good since we're in the stories with Jesus section. Bring it. Bob, he says this, a parable is not a delivery system for an idea. It is not like a shell casing that can be discarded once the idea, the shell, is fired. Rather, a parable is a house in which the reader or listener is invited to take up residence. The reader is encouraged to look out on the world from the point of view of the story. A house has a variety of windows and rooms, thus the parable may have one primary idea with other secondary ideas encased within it. It may have a cluster of theological themes held together by the story. Naturally, the interpreter should only look for the themes that were available to the first century audience listening to Jesus. And so then he goes on to list like this theme cluster that's in the prodigal son, and he has like 10. So he says, you can learn something here about all of these things. Freedom, uh, like God gave us freedom, like the son left. Uh, Repentance, we see the theme of the son coming to his senses. Mm -hmm. Although Bailey actually makes the point that uh, the son's true repentance came as he was embraced by the father on the road. And that he was prepared with the plan to kind of earn his way back. And on the edge of town, Bailey says he's not sure that he was fully repentant until he saw the father running, shaming himself, humiliating himself for his son. And at that Mm. point, Mm. uh, the son was broken by his father's love and kindness. As Paul says, it's the kindness of God that actually leads us to repentance. Nice. Other clusters, you learn about God's fatherhood. You learn about sonship. You learn about family. You learn about... Uh, even eschatology, this image of a table and a banquet. So uh, just Bailey's really helpful, and I'll just recommend that one more time. Check that out. Bailey. You will love it. You'll probably want to read it more than once. It's short. And then at the end, he puts together this play. I was going to give this to Steve Tossie. It's like a play really? that you can act out, and um, it's not exactly the the parable. It's like a version of the story that's super creative of like eight characters and and 
it's it's a very easy read. It's the first half's the book, and then the second half's like the play. Hey, Check this that'd book be a out. great play. We got to do that. Somewhere. I was thinking, yeah, like. Maybe this thing has some legs, so Clint can play the the role of the prodigal son. Yeah, it's got a cluster. And uh, <laughs> you can, you go, Clint. You can bring your airsoft guns and and all of your <laughs> equipment and all that stuff, and kind of reenact your teenage years. You know what I mean? Oh so, man, <laughs> that's an inside joke for those of you who know Clint. All right, so there you go. Anyway, right. good book recommendation. It's a well, wonderful parable. Thanks for bringing the word, Pastor Dave. Any concluding thoughts on the prodigal? Yeah, I would just continue to encourage us uh, to remember the beauty of the gospel. Remember, the main point is this. Uh, Jesus welcomes sinners, and he is encouraging us and inviting us to rejoice with him about this. So are we really rejoicing with the fact that our God welcomes sinners? That's the challenge of Luke chapter 15. So um, let's rejoice with him. Good. All right. So we've come to the theology sprint, and uh, Noah gave us a few options here. Do you want to? You wanna, I think we're going to go with option number three. Pastor Dave was chomping at the bit. Do you want to? You want to read that one for us? All right. Yes. So our theology sprint question for today is: Does the Bible condone slavery? And I thought of Pastor Dave because he did a wonderful sermon several years ago on the Book of Philemon, which gets at the whole slavery concept, and uh, now that you've ruminated on it for about forty-five minutes, what what what's what truth can you spit out at us? Yeah, I mean, any tough theological question usually gets answered well, yes and no. So it depends on what you mean. Usually, when we here in America think about slavery, we think about nineteenth-century race-based slavery, which was based on kidnapping and was slavery for life. Um, the Bible would condone no such thing. That is uh, an evil that was rooted out of our society, and I would say it was the Christians that were at the forefront of that movement, like William Wilberforce mm -hmm, and others. Mm -hmm. But the Bible does talk about a concept of indentured servanthood. So if you were in debt, in, a, in over your eyeballs, there was no Chapter 13 process, but you could sell yourself to someone and attach yourself to someone. In fact, in the prodigal son story, the, the younger brother attaches himself to some farmer and starts feeding his pigs in that mm. way. So he's got nothing, but he's going to go find a way to like sell himself. And you could do that for a period of time. Could be seven years, could be 14 years. And then you were expected to be emancipated and you got your manumission papers within a decade or two. That was the typical practice. Now that became corrupted. Uh, that was abused at times, and by the time we got to first century Rome, there was a kind of slavery that was uh, much more egregious and uh, much more displeasing uh, than that sort of monetary kind of servanthood idea. Now, was the Bible used in a way to endorse American slavery? Uh, yes, and that's a sad part of our history here in the South, and uh, but we would say that it was not used properly. The Bible was misused in that way, and it was abused in that way. Uh, so that's not a proper use of biblical hermeneutics. That's a misinterpretation. So when you see the Bible speak about slavery, just maybe try on the idea that the Bible might not actually be talking what, about what you think it's talking about. And so there's, there's, a, there's my answer. So Clinton, Bob, can you guys color that in a little bit. I thought that sure. was a great answer, Pastor Dave. Mm -hmm. Good for you, man. Make sure that was No, good. good I think enough. You, I think you hit on all the all the high points and the caveats and everything there, so. Well, one more thing about that yeah. little tiny letter to Philemon. One little chapter. Philemon's got a runaway slave named Onesimus and Paul finds him. He becomes his spiritual father. Onesimus accepts the gospel. He comes back. And uh, Paul actually tells him to go back and he encourages Philemon to welcome him back as a man, as a free man, no longer as a slave. And he encourages him to do that. He says, I could order you to do that, but out of love, I want to urge you to do it this way. And he welcomes him back into the church as a free man. Um, and that little letter, that one chapter letter, has been a powerful influence in church history against mm. uh, the institution of slavery, because this is the natural outflowing of what the gospel um, does. It sets us free and it teaches us how to love our neighbor and teaches us how to treat others fairly. And the natural outworkings of following the red letters of Christ are um, to look out for what's best uh, for others and for, for the commonwealth. And so um, 
Philemon is a wonderful letter. You should check it out. It's it's groundbreaking. Very cool. Awesome. Well, with that being said, uh, we're now on to our closing segments. We're going to let you know what's going on in the life of our church body. Thank you for sticking with us for the podcast today. Thanks to Clint for being here. Yeah, Clint uh, Watkins. Don't worry. We got, we got some closing comments here, but let me just mention a few things that are <laughs> happening. Uh, number one, we have Charter Day is uh, coming up in uh in a in a, w- a week from saturday actually so um <clears throat> i was told this morning that we we've had some folks step up to volunteer uh, about 14 or 15 we would like 20 so we need five more people can i hear if you're out there can i hear you say five five push five. pause on the video <clears throat> right now go sign up for charter day that's right that's right it's it's a great way to to volunteer and to let the community know that we we love them and we're here for them so in the fact slots Clint, are, are <clears throat> shorter this year the slots are an hour and a half slot there you go uh you'll meet us there we'll so you have no excuses. set up for you and you'll just hang out and be friendly with those in our community let them know that uh <laughs> millington baptist church is a wonderful place yeah that's, that's very good now clint you grew up going to uh charter day we were chatting about before what what can you say about your your uh, recollections of charter day it is a great time. I mean, that was one of the places where I was prodigaling as a child, but ah. maybe you'll meet little runaways at Charter Day. That's true. So it, to know Jesus. it was Clint's prodigal playground, and if you want to find prodigals <laughs> with people trying to eat swine, then you need to go to Charter Day and, and bring them back to the Father. There you go. See what see what I did there, Pastor Dave? That that, that was this that was some segue, Bob. That was you're getting really good at this. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> Charter Day, Saturday the 18th. Please go sign up immediately. Uh, secondly, just a reminder, this coming Sunday is Mother's Day. So if you have not ordered a, uh, a floral arrangement, uh, shame on you. I'm not sure it's going to get there in time. Uh, but anyway, there still might be hope. Mother's Day is this coming uh, Sunday. We are doing a special uh, message on the women of Luke. If you've been following with us, you know that Luke uh, has a... Uh, I should say Luke highlights women quite a bit, much more than any other gospel writer. So we'll do a a special uh, message on that, as well as uh, carnations and Mother's Day themed elements. So we hope to see you for this uh, this coming uh, Sunday. And then lastly, Drew Huber did a wonderful job letting you know about the cancellation of pickleball this last Sunday. Uh, there was a wedding that Pastor Dave officiated. You had a pretty busy weekend this I weekend, did. Pastor Dave. Yep. Yeah, how are you feeling it's today? It's a busy week. There's a wedding. There's also a funeral. So uh, it's good. Good Goodness opportunities gracious. for the gospel, okay. but um, it's busy. So pickleball had to uh, had to be rescinded this week because of the wedding. And also it was pouring and rain. It, was so also it, it would really have been canceled rainy. anyway, just so you know, if you were complaining. Uh, but this coming uh, uh, Sunday night is Mother's Day. So I don't know. Noah, are we going to have pickleball or women's focus pickleball? I don't know. Unfortunately, the uh, decision came through uh, for Sunday, and it is oh. canceled again for Mother's ah, Day, but we'll so be back spoken. the following week. So May 19th, come back for Pickleball. Store up your Plus, energy. <clears throat> it will be a good day. All right. And that's all I got today, Pastor Dave. What what an amazing show uh, that we had here. We had Clint. We had you. We had the prodigal. We had we had a chart we on an orange piece of paper. We had a homemade, impromptu chart that we made on the this fly today. This was amazing. Clint. There's a chart for that. Clint, will you, based on your experience today, will you come back and be on another Behind the Pulpit? I would love to. <laughs> I would prefer to be in person so I can see the charts and take part. Of hey, I heard a rumor about <laughs> an in-person Clint situation. Is that is that rumor true that there might be coming a time in a in a Sunday in the near future where we might see Clint live. Gee, the, the return of Christ is nearing, and Clint will be here. <laughs> Usher in. <laughs> Usher in the parousia. Wow. I think we decided on July 14th you're going to take part in our summer series, and you'll, you'll be here. Yep. I now forget. that I'm ushering in the return of Christ, no pressure. Yeah. Well, actually, and we did give you one well, of the— Isn't his passage re- related to that or no? No, he's doing the—he's uh, doing actually one of the only parables in the last— he's doing the parable of the— the ten minas, I think. Oh, so I think it was the wicked tenant. Or the, oh, you're tenants. doing the wicked tenant. The wicked tenant. There you go. Sorry. The yeah. Thanks tenant. for an easy passage, guys. <laughs> hey, that's that's why we bring in the big guns for that, you know. <laughs> so you can. So if you stay over, you can come on Monday for behind the pulpit, and you can do a chart for that parable. Okay. So you start Deal. start drawing right now. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, I might need some help on this one. So. All right, man. My Luke commentaries are your Luke commentaries, but it looks like you got you got everything you need behind you there, so you should be fine. Very true. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Clint. Thanks, Dave, for being here for Behind the Pulpit. Uh, we'll be here next week. Same, same 
bat time, same bat channel. We'll be here behind the pulpit. We hope to see you then. Pow, zoom. Do the Batman ending here. <laughs> see you guys. <laughs>